Hello, everyone, and welcome to another fine episode of the Love Fruit Podcast. We've got another special guest today, and today we're joined by Roger King. And for those of you who've been at the UK Fruit Fest over the last four or five years, you know that Roger's uh, played a, an important part of, of that event. Roger has um, been a counsellor for around 50 years. He's written a number of books, um, books often about love and about loving yourself. Uh, he has been at one point a professional windsurfer and has many other interesting stories and tales to tell. So uh, I wanted to bring Roger on to, um, to, sh to share his story. And I think he can be of service and of help to a lot of people out there. So I uh, wanted to help share his message as well. So Roger, is there anything, anything else you'd like to tell us about yourself as a bit of an introduction? Well, I was a semi-professional. I did it <laughs> in races in Barcelona, um, in Spain. But I was totally obsessed with windsurfing. When I yeah. get really obsessed, I really go for it. Um, well, really, I want to paint a little picture. And the picture is of a young boy sort of born to two parents who got married in the war, mm. who didn't know how to love themselves. Mm -hmm. They were both brutalized in different ways. And I was the youngest of three children with two older sisters. But four weeks after I was born in London, we moved to this house, a broken down old Tudor house in the Chilterns. And there, there was two acres of orchard of apples, plums, cherries. Oh, wow. It was amazing. And although we were very, very poor, we lived on a very simple diet, really. Um, we had very little meat because we couldn't afford meat. Mm -hmm. And milk in those days was not so um, processed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as it was as it is now, sprayed on fields, etc. And the whole idea now of milk just turns me off, actually. Right. But this boy grew up always wanting to find out if there was more to life. I was always asking incisive questions. Can there be more to life than what I'm experiencing? Mm-hmm. I was often bullied at school. I grew up with a very low self-esteem. But the one thing I did have was nature and fruit. <laughs> you know, I would always pick whatever I wanted in season. And I, I can remember picking the apples, which were, of course, organic. And they tasted so good. And the plums, I mean, if the wasps didn't get them, I got them. <laughs> Plum bum, often. <laughs> but it gave me an appetite for what is natural. Right. And, you know, for anybody watching this little podcast, when we taste something really good, sweet and lovely, it... It, it changes your whole vibration. It changes what's going on in here, what comes out of here, and what's going on in your body to every cell. Your neuropeptides are constantly going to every cell in your body. And so that's where I started to fall in love with fruit. And, you know, if you think of this small boy growing up but I knew that I could grow strong I mean my father was one of these people who was a big man and he'd take us to the Lake District and he would send us on 20 mile hikes up steep mountains with a big pack on the back yeah and I nearly lost my life at one point on that 
but it gave me an inner strength. Mm -hmm. I didn't like being forced to do things. Mm -hmm. I was always a rebel. And if there's any rebels out there, um, join me. But I wanted to rebel with knowledge, with good knowledge that I wanted to learn outside school, outside university. I knew that there was a whole array of information that I wasn't receiving. And it was really, I mean, I went through many relationships in my early life, always with this very low self-esteem, really. I always thought that out there I would get confidence in here. Mm. But I didn't know how until I met certain teachers, uh, like Carl Rogers, a great psychotherapist, Louise Hay, who I'm a facilitator of You Can Heal Your Life, mm -hmm. and many others. And... I was extremely lucky in my life. At certain times in my life, people came to me. The law of attraction brought people to me. I believe because I was always asking the question, there must be more to life than what I'm living. I was greedy for knowledge. I was greedy to find out how to use this mind, mm -hmm. how to keep this body healthy, how to have I mean, I was sent to church from very young to absolve my parents' sins, I think, with my two sisters. And I sat in the choir and I couldn't, I couldn't work out how, why the rich people sat at the front and the poor people at the back <laughs> of a church. And although I loved singing and being in the choir and bell ringing and doing things, I always felt that what I was being taught about this concept of a God with a white beard looking at your genitals saying bad. <laughs> you know, I just couldn't believe it. <laughs> and it's, it was a sort of eye opener when I just thought, I can't keep on sitting in this pew, singing these songs, reading the Bible, I wanted to know more about truth, mm. about honesty, about openness. And it doesn't mean that I don't believe in a goddess, a God, a universal mind. I do believe that there is the unseen force that is there, that is often directing our lives. But we need to ask the right incisive questions to begin to attract the people, the knowledge, the books mm. at the right time to us. Mm. And often we're not taught how to think. And I love Nancy Klein's book, Time to Think. It's a beautiful book. And um, the quality of our thinking and the quality of, of our emotional language is so important, our emotional intelligence. I was useless at school. I, I, I just was a daydreamer because when I was at home to get away from my parents and sisters who were always quarreling, I'd go and sit in nature mm. and watch the animals and, and just meditate on a tree. I didn't realize I was med learning to meditate. Mm. And that was so exciting. Mm -hmm. it, 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 you know, nature is so exciting. It empowers you from within. You know, it's very difficult to look at a rose and think hateful thoughts. Yeah. You know, or to look at a beautiful ripe mango. Mm -hmm. You know, that it's like we're connected. Our whole spirit is connected to nature, to the sky, to the stars, to everything. And so often our education cuts us off from that. Mm -hmm. A mechanistic, scientific, political education that sometimes washes our brain of that beautiful instinct that we all have of empowerment through beautiful fruit, through trees, through 
a blade of grass just to you know a blade of grass knows how to do a blade of grass but we humans often don't know how to do humans mm -hmm. especially at the moment we are being divided and ruled yes so often and it's so uncaring so unnecessary so this boy grew up into a teenager having love affairs and but never felt lovable right and then i went and lived with ex-prisoners in a hostel in leeds where i was surrounded by men who were completely rejected as children i listened to their stories i was only 16. i mean that would never be allowed now <laughs> I went from one fire into another furnace, really. And I stayed there nearly two years, working in this hostel in Leeds. But it taught me a lot about, in deep inside us, there's this beautiful kernel of unconditional love. But it's wrapped up in so many barbed wire old beliefs we have about ourselves. Mm -hmm. Because our subconscious mind has often been told you're bad, you're wrong, you're not good enough, you're not clever as your sister, you're too big, your hips aren't right, your face is not good, whatever it is. But these men taught me the beauty of feeling, the beauty of that they could, by talking, by being listened to, by being understood, they began to change their life. And that helped me changed my life because really I could have so easily if I hadn't met this man on the train that um, employed me as a community oh. service volunteer at one pound ten a week mm. he put me there in this hostel and it was just the most amazing healing experience of an inner courage and an inner warrior love that I could find in myself and I knew that I had to keep working on myself. I went into my first marriage but uh, still I wasn't truly aware and I had a beautiful daughter but I realized very early on I didn't love the person because I didn't love myself. Mm -hmm. I felt forced into the situation. Mm -hmm. And so many people that I counsel often say to me, I don't know why I married him. Or I don't know why I married her. Wow, really? Yeah. And it's such a shame. We hide ourselves under these beliefs of what we should do, what we ought to do. But it doesn't find the true miracle we are. One of my first books that I wrote was Love the Miracle You Are. And that was a wonderful way of exploring myself through some of my clients and, and my history to understand me to me. There was a sort of two wolves inside me from the old story. There was one wolf that was really kind, loving, forgiving, creative. But there was this other tempting wolf that was so... How can I put it? It was so greedy. Mm. It was jealous. Mm. It was angry. Mm. And it was full of fear. And those two me's were having at times a lot of conflict. Mm -hmm. And when I came to relationships, the law of attraction saw this, I believe, this conflict in me and said, well, are you willing to learn again from certain relationships? Are you willing to, to really grow and would test me and test me? I see life as a series of lessons. Mm. And I'm nearly 73 and I really am continually learning lessons in my old age. And I suppose one of the key aspects that I always wanted to do was how do I empower myself to take full responsibility for my life? 
yep. instead of waiting for somebody to rescue me. Because I thought I was a victim, I wanted somebody to rescue me, and then I wanted somebody to persecute and blame. <laughs> that triangle that so many people go around in their life. I wanted to break out of that triangle of just being a victim with a very heavy judge, internalized judge. And I suppose a big turning point was meeting people like Carl Rogers. I'm just reading his book at the moment called Becoming Partners. And there's one chapter in there that if anybody can get it, it's called Irene and the three marriages on one growing person. And that chapter where Carl is listening to her, she seems to unfold so many different layers and conditioning. And the healing quality of the climate that he listened to her in helped her really develop such insight, which I would have loved to have known years ago. Mm. Mm. And so many people, so many of my clients also, and I often recommend that chapter, that they read it and reread it. And it's lovely when people do and they get it, mm. they really imbibe it, they take it in. Because we all have different ways of learning. Yeah. And some of us are very cerebral, left-hand brain but others need to experience it deep inside ourselves. And I love it when people, and I, I was working with somebody yesterday in London, and he's in a very tough, tough profession. And he's just wonderfully beginning to experience his own inner love for himself because he's in a very brutal occupation mm. and had a very tough childhood and it's lovely when that thirst of who am i why am i here what is my purpose is unfolding in a person and i love that process and to me you know, when I met you, Ronnie, um, I'll just switch my phone off. Sure, sure. Um, when I came to the UK Fruit Fest about seven years... Oh, hello, Ronnie. Yep, still here. Oh, oh yeah. My computer. <laughs> <laughs> when I met you at the UK Fruit Fest, I was a rather resistant person, thinking, is this some sort of cult? fruitarianism because I I've been through many cults myself different but they all taught me something mm -hmm. because they taught things outside the system mm -hmm. and to me sometimes conspiracies and cults can be informing if you have a discerning mind right your own and you think in your own mind right good sometimes to be around different people who challenge your beliefs and as long as you don't get sucked totally in and you feel always inadequate mm -hmm. they can be abusive and that is something I've seen in in religions I work a lot with people who have been abused in different religions right that have said who's lovable who's right who's wrong mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and made people full of fear and guilt and shame which is such a shame in itself. But when I came to the UK Fruit Fest with Karen, I was resistant. But then I thought, as I grow old, I need to look after my health. I love looking after my health. And when I listened to Doug and Anne and Chris and Melissa and various people and yourself, I thought, they know something I don't know at this point in time in my life. I need to really begin to study and learn about how my body works, 
what I know a lot about my mental diet, mm -hmm. but I need to also look at my physical diet. Mm -hmm. What is mm -hmm. good for my cells? What is good for my blood, my organs? If I'm going to live in my old age with some degree of excellence, that's not perfection, but some degree of energy and vitality, it was really important that Somehow I'd attracted Karen into my life after my second marriage went wrong. I had a great second marriage and I, I love, I, I have peace with all my relationships now. And my family is two families, mm -hmm. great friends. Tomorrow we'll all be together. Great. Which is lovely. And so I was seeking this information and really, I suppose, the old memories of, of being a child picking an apple off a tree and plums and cherries and, and the vitality that he gave me as a kid. I feel like when I met you and you had arranged this UK Fruit Fest, it, and I looked around me and I saw these wonderful people really searching too and associating with each other and telling their stories over beautiful fruit prepared meals that I thought, oh my goodness, you know, watermelons, melons, oh, <laughs> out my ears. You know, I was greedy for that, but I was greedy to hear people's stories, yes. to hear the talents that they had inside them. Mm -hmm and to feel their, their vision, their dream, to feel it, to know that they wanted to live a different life. Yes. They wanted to find out about relationships with food, with people, with spirituality. And they wanted, I saw a real earnest desire to think outside the box and that I love when I meet people like you and others who think outside the box and act outside the box and commit themselves and be consistent my old Buddhist teacher you say Roger are you consistent right in doing something good or are you just going to be a pink fluff of air <laughs> yeah he was brutal <laughs> but he was loving and I saw the consistency was really important. And I think that over the years, like reading this, this wonderful book that, um, by Anne Osborne. Yes. That's now 120 quid on Amazon. <laughs> brutal organization. Um, <laughs> it's a wonderful book because it just gives you so much information. Mm. And she, she talks from her own spirit, her own heart. Yeah. And that's what I saw in all the speakers that were there. They spoke from their own heart and they lived their life as congruently and transparently, as honestly as possible. And, you know, it was just wonderful and, and it was a, an atmosphere where, yeah, I really made a deep commitment to learn how to look after myself and to really move my eating habits more and more to fruit, mm, more yeah. and more yeah. to beautiful salads, more and more to, yeah, just feeling that vitality and you know it was amazing last night listening to your lecture on the downfalls of why people move back into cooked food etc and i think that i i know i'm not perfect i sometimes slip but i don't beat myself up yeah. but i go back to eating fruit i mean if you saw my kitchen at the moment it's full of fruit because mm. if I focus on that fruit, as Ted Carr says, 
that's the best thing to do <laughs> you know and have plenty you know i've got my my beautiful berries here you know i'm always because i'm a bit of a snacker mm. and that's me but i'm snacking on something that's got love in it i think it's it was Erhard, Arnold Erhardt, who said, it is farcical, not to say pitiful, to pray to the Creator for a miracle healing, rejecting and disregarding real divine food, mm. the fruits of the paradise, the bread of heaven, and instead of stuff your stomach three times daily with harmful prepared food, manufactured by man for commercial purposes, and never destined by the Creator, to be man's food at all you know i love wow. that, that that and so many of his quotes in the back of Anne's book are so they just rivet me yeah. back into wanting to rely on fruit and good vegetables mm. so let's get let's um mm. let's ask a few more questions i mean You've had a fascinating life. There's a few things I wanted to, I want to ask you about. Actually, quite a number of things. One of them is I know you've had a life of fitness. You've you've always been active, and I'd like to learn a bit more from you about what that means. And also, you you became a dancer. I don't know if that was later in life, but you do teach these dance classes. I'd like to know about that. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'd also like to ask you about early on in life. You've had a number of sort of quite interesting, maybe spiritual type experiences. I know you nearly fell off a cliff one time. I wonder if you could tell us that story. Yeah. Well, that was in the Lake District. And I used to love running up mountains. Um, and I didn't realize how strong I was, but I'd run ahead of my family. And I was probably about eight nine and i went up the side of i think it was called saddleback mm -hmm. mountain and i went up and i i come to the end of this path and i grabbed hold of this rock and there was a complete ravine down there and suddenly the rock came off in my hand and then, as though it was some sort of miracle, and it may sound strange to your listeners, but a voice came inside my head saying, it's not your time now, yet, you've got too much to do. Bang, and put me flat. It was like this wind and pushed me back onto this mountain. Yeah. I was pretty nervous after that. But that whisper has stayed with me in various times in my life, especially when I meditate in the morning, when I slow this chatterbox down. Meditation for me is when we slow this down and we get a whisper from deep inside us to the universal mind. Yep. that is always wanting the best for us. Often I disagree with it, but <laughs> that's my resistance sometimes. <laughs> but if I follow it intuitively and I write it down, it's amazing what wisdom and discernment comes to me. Sure. So that was a very, very first. And the, the second one, was really diving in to a dolphin when I was a windsurfer. And that was when that dolphin and I just immediately fell in love. I looked into its eyes and it looked into me and it could see me and I could see it. And we just played for a whole week. Wow. I'm going for two or three hours each day. Where was that? That was Amble, north of Newcastle. Oh, wow. And the dolphin 
I, I was a member of Dolphin Watch and Horace Dobbs had gone up the week before and taken a fisherman's hook out of this dolphin. Goodness, yeah. Um, and the light keeper, in those days we had light keepers, and the light keeper had asked Horace to come up to do this. And Horace just put it out that there's this dolphin that may want to swim with people. Wow. So I was up there <laughs> with my young family and people would just watch and then some people got really keen and jumped into it. It was amazing. But sometimes the dolphins swam right away from people. Mm. It's really mm. interesting. The vibration that some people gave off and the other vibration it, it sensed whether there was harmony and peace and safety within you or there was anger fear and something and it would just swim off but it would allow me to put my arms around it and it would take me right out and that was i found out more about feeling of ecstatic love in that wow. week than I've ever experienced, I think, before or since. But I knew that I had this ability in me to love life instead of criticize and blame life and my the cards I've been dealt with. It was the beginning of learning yeah. how to forgive forgive yeah. my parents, forgive people who'd hurt me, but most of all, forgive myself. So a dolphin was one of your important teachers? Yeah. Wow. Fascinating. Tell me about some of your other teachers, and I know you've had a few interesting teachers over the years. I think when I met Louise Hay, when my dearest friend had died, Alex, who taught me windsurfing, by the way. He was a lovely, lovely man. And he was a great counsellor. And he just died one day, walking up a hill, going into a client's house, and suddenly had this massive heart attack at the oh, age of 65. Mm -hmm. It was so, so sad. I was mortified. And I came back to his funeral the next day. I was in in um, Cyprus and I was on the top of a wave I can remember windsurfing and I had this dreadful feeling about Alex mm. it must have been the time that he died yeah, yeah anyway when I came home my ex-wife rang me up at four in the morning and said Alex has died the funeral is today so I went to the funeral and I can remember listening to the eulogies and I just suddenly broke open my tears because I was always taught, don't cry, big boys don't cry. Yeah. You know, be tough, be macho. And I can remember I cried for a month. I couldn't stop crying. Wow. But one day I just got into my old wagon and went to the library in Wakefield, where I lived. And this, this set of tapes by Louise Hay came out, CDs. And I got them out of the library, put them in my cassette thing in the car, drove round and parked and listened to this woman. And what she said made so much sense mm -hmm. to me, to mm -hmm. my inner child, the part that I left unloved, that I'd never really come across, that I always suppressed that hurt inner child. And that book, which has now sold nearly 100 million copies, it had only sold a third of a million when I got it, um she became a real mentor to me and i was lucky to meet her twice and i gave her a copy of my book love the miracle you are 
and she gave me such a big hug. And she was only a small woman, and I, I expected this huge, you know, <laughs> very, you know, creative woman. And of course she was. But she didn't start living her life till she was 50. Mm. Her story is so fascinating to read, and it's touched so many people's lives that her own story of being so brutalized, sexually abused, having a child that she had to give away, etc. And she thought she was unintelligent, useless, mm -hmm. until she attracted people who gave her certain gifts. But the biggest gift that she got, she went to a science of mind service and she heard one thing, when you change your thoughts, you change your life. And she grabbed onto that affirmation and she started to learn. And she became, well, a teacher. She's created Hay House. She died two years ago, but she's created a self-help organization the biggest in the world. Mm -hmm. And I think she gave me the permission, my, my sort of Buddhist teachers and other teachers were quite tough. She gave me the permission to be kind to myself mm -hmm. and not be brutal mm -hmm. with truth. Sometimes we can be brutal with truth and that makes a person feel, ah, Mm -hmm. fearful mm -hmm. and ashamed not good enough which then you know imbibe goes back into that terrible belief that often i see in my clients is i'm not good enough or i shouldn't have been born which is such a shame those beliefs and they have a whole array of agreements around them those two beliefs so she was very important Don Miguel Ruiz was another important teacher. The Four Agreements. Yeah. And he's actually written a book, The Fifth Agreement. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, well, The Four Agreements, I don't know if it would help, just very quickly. Sure. First of all, be impeccable with your word. Mm -hmm. Secondly, don't take anything personally, mm -hmm. which people do. <laughs> um, don't make assumptions. Ask good questions. Whenever you feel you're making an assumption about somebody or a judgment, ask questions. When, in, when you're in a conflict situation, in a marital or lover relationship or with a boss, Ask incisive questions that help them dissolve your assumptions, your negative assumptions about them. Yeah. And the fourth one is to always do your best. We know that we won't always do our best. We will slip, we will slide, mm -hmm. but don't beat yourself up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the fifth agreement is that and this is very poignant to me. When you listen to a person's story, you know some of it will be exaggerated. It won't be complete truth. Yeah. It will be on the way to truth. So you have to discern what is true and what is not true. And you need to be prepared to understand that people as they risk sharing themselves risk being more and more transparent they will make certain statements about themselves that aren't true mm -hmm. because of all our conditioning the agreements that we make with ourselves and have an, an awareness that the truth will come maybe later. Yeah. 
And for me, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Jahari window. No. Joseph Luft and Harry Ingham, two psychologists, had this idea of a window and you quartered that window. There's part of me that you know and I know. I'm wearing a red scarf, I've got glasses, I've got white horrible hair. No, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> but you know certain things about me. You can see it. Sure. Then there's part of me that you know that I don't know. Wow. You see things in me that I don't know. Then there's part of me that I know, but you don't know, that I keep secret. Now, if I'm going to expand that window into its full potential, I need to be able to get feedback from you, if I trust you, to give me feedback on what I am, what I'm good at, what my talents could be, and be able to trust and listen to you, to expand that, that front sort of portion. And then I need to trust you to be more honest about myself and be able to say what really is going on in me. Yeah. Now the thing is, that also expands the last section that's hidden to you and to me. It's my potential. Mm -hmm. It's my possible skills. It's my possible area that I've never explored. Mm -hmm. And in counseling, what I try and do is help that person to be the complete window of who they really are. Yeah. And that is such an exciting process, but it requires deep trust, deep listening, incisive questions that are not too threatening. It needs spending time, real time with that person. Yeah. When I've changed the most, it's when somebody has spent real time with me in that window and built a whole area of something that they didn't know, I didn't know, and a deeper insight has come into me. Yeah. Yeah. About who I am, why I'm here, what's my purpose. Don't know if that makes any sense. Yeah, it does. It's very interesting. Um, you've, uh, well, what I, something I want to ask you about, you, you, you work as a counsellor. Mm. I'm, I'm interested in knowing these issues that people have, that people come to you for. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if it's, I don't know specifically, but you know, people are depressed, people are anxious, people are disconnected, mm. um, probably struggling to make relationships with people and, and deal with things like that. Mm. In your perception, what, what are the main issues that people have out there? Why, why do they happen? Why do humans have these um, emotional, psychological issues? What a question. What a question, <laughs> Ray. It's dropping me in the deep end. I think first, our subconscious mind has been conditioned to believe certain beliefs about ourselves. And if those messages that come into our subconscious mind past our conscious mind are highly negative, highly limiting, those beliefs will be played out in our life. Like big boys mustn't cry. <laughs> Girls aren't tough enough. You know, those such limit, limiting beliefs. Um, oh, you're not as clever as your brother. Yeah. The amount of beliefs that go in to that subconscious mind, the subconscious mind never takes a joke. It will always accept what it is hearing, what it's feeling. 
Mm -hmm. The conscious mind, though, if you can begin to create a climate where the conscious mind can relearn, feel safe enough to reprogram those limiting beliefs, you can create an inner discernment, an inner wisdom, an inner way of using the law of attraction because whatever we think and whatever we say goes out into that universal mind and comes back to us as experience. That's what I believe. So the more I change those limiting beliefs that I have about myself, the more I can really move my life in a direction that doesn't lead to depression, that doesn't lead to suicide, that doesn't lead to continued failed relationships, that begins to feed us with something that is nutritious on a mental, emotional, physical and spiritual level. All those levels need to be healed to some extent and aligned. So I think that when people understand how their mind works and how they can realign and go into that old set of beliefs and change them gradually, then drugs, alcohol, addictions to sex, whatever it is, we build an immune system mental, emotional, physical and spiritual that really says we are powerful mm -hmm. and we, I take full responsibility for my life. I don't expect doctors, psychiatrists, others to come to me and tell me who I am mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. give me drugs. I am responsible for my life. I'm an empowered person doesn't mean I'm better than anybody else, but I begin to radiate a sense of harmony and peace. And you know, Ronnie, if somebody comes into the room, you can either pick up two sort of vibes. One is, oh golly, oh, I don't know if I want to be around that person. Or there is a person smiling who is really feels transparent. You think, oh, I'd like to get to know that person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And often in aging, I deal a lot through with dance and through my practice with older people who are very scared, who are very depressed, who are very down at the moment and who are listening to the radio, to social media, and sometimes I get hooked in with that. Mm -hmm. But it's so often negative, and so often it's the same sort of stuff that's going into that subconscious mind that went in early on in childhood. Yeah. Of fear, of guilt, of resentment, which is old anger, which is shame those four elements so often block us from really loving ourselves accepting ourselves and beginning to be an empowered person in every area of our life in relationships in work in our relationship with money our relationship with giving really serving others because we're also worried about ourselves we forget other people but when we're really empowered we touch other people hopefully for good not for bad don't know if that makes any sense yeah it does i've got a tough question for you thanks <laughs> <clears throat> actually maybe you'll find this an easy question what is your definition of love and if someone says i love you if you say you you love yourself what what does that actually mean i think we're here to learn unconditional love. Mm. We can't take our bank account. We can't take our car. 
We can't take our house. Mm. We can't take this body. Mm. But what we can do is take our capacity for love, mm -hmm. unconditional love. Mm -hmm. Where we begin to stop comparing ourselves with others, we, we begin to become vital on every level. Mm -hmm. And we find this kernel inside us of unconditional love. Yeah. We begin to evaporate and dissolve all the judgments we've had about ourselves and others. Mm -hmm. We stop criticizing, blaming, and we begin to really find a way of living where we're not scared of death. When we accept that this time is finite, we don't know the next chapter. Yeah. But I believe the next chapter could be really exciting. If I keep working on this, mm -hmm. this whole miracle that I was given in this life. So unconditional love is where we really are heading towards. And do you think that eating fruit and, and dancing and being healthy and all the things you do are, are, are all a part of loving yourself and are, yeah. are a symptom of it as well? It's just like they feed each other. Right. Fruit, veganism is a most revolutionary action, quietly revolutionary. If everybody became vegan and gradually raw vegan over the next 20, 30 years, it would make a significant difference to our world. We'd be far more peaceful inside. We'd be far more connected to nature. We'd still, there would be some people that would protest, some people work with the homeless, some people need to help different countries we all have skills and i think the more we actually change our life from inside out and we put good stuff inside we will find our vision we will find our purpose and we will help this world move and turn in a different way mm. all the hurt leaders that we have at the moment and quite limited in their self-love, honest love, respectful love. There is a certain a love that is narcissistic, that it can become very abusive. That is not love. That is creating a very angry, abusive, self-abusive way of being. Mm -hmm. Now, let me ask you about dance, because I know that's very important to you. Yeah, I was dancing last night on Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> what, what got you in? When did you start doing that? And, and, um, when I was four years old. <laughs> and I know you've said to me that it was kind of quite healing for you at times. I'd like to ask you about that. What, what, what do you mean by that? Well... When I was young, I used to try and stop hearing what was going on around in this old Tudor house. And I remember a big carpet and I used to play the Eroica on an old gramophone record and other classics. And I'd just dance around this carpet. And I can remember a, a, a tune by Michael Holliday who actually committed suicide, the story of my life. And that, that record and many other records, um, 78s, and then it, of course we got 45s, 33s, you know, it was great. Mm -hmm. I just loved listening to music and at five o'clock on a 
Sunday night I'd record on my Grundig tape recorder all the top of the pops mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I'd dance around my bedroom. So it started very young that if I danced, I could be in a different world. Right. And like last night, there was a woman on the bio dancer session and I could see she was, she was playing with her hair. She was sitting there and I just made eye contact with her and just came close to the screen and danced with her depression, whatever you call it, her depressed state of being. And just her, light, her eyes lit up and it was like her soul lit up mm -hmm. and she started dancing. Just a little tiny miracle. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. You know, like when you when you sing, when you get that guitar in your hand, it does something to your spirit, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Starts to move. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just great when we're at the UK Fruit Fest and you get out your guitar around the fire and <laughs> sing and you get us all involved. Yeah, so you've played a big part in the in the festival over the years, and, and as you were saying, you you came as an attendee. You didn't come to speak, but you've you've ended up being for many people one of the most favourite parts of the festival uh, with your with your dance classes and your your workshops. Mm. Let me let me ask you, what's what's the festival given to you? It's given me a deep belief that if I eat and drink good stuff, my body hums with life. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then I can go out and do the work that I'm meant to do and be as transparent as I possibly can so that people can't hook me with their pain. Wow. When you're transparent, people can't put those emotional hooks, mental hooks into you and drag you in the drama of their pain. Because I'd be no good to people if I go right. down the hole with them. Right. I want to lift them up to a different state of consciousness, awareness, and help them transform. They're going to do the work. I don't do the work. All I do is maybe give them some pointers, some knowledge. And if they're willing to do the push-ups and enjoy the journey eventually, it's amazing what happens. Yeah. So that's the UK Fruit Fest, you know, has given me the physio physiological but also the beautiful people that come. Right. I love belonging to a tribe of people that are doing their best to change their diet. Yeah, yeah. On every level. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it's been great. It's been great seeing you be such a, a bigger part of it. And I think people do like the message that you share. Um, why do you think that it resonates with so many people what, what you what you have to share? People are searching. Mm -hmm. They're really searching. They're asking questions about every area of their life. They're about their work, about how they're going to live, how they can lose weight, how they can stop themselves getting cancer, having heart attacks, etc. They're asking all sorts of questions of themselves. And I think that those questions will bring them to people like you and many others to be a guide for them. They will push against you well, I love it when people come in and say, I'm, you're going to be your worst client. You'll never change me. And I say, no, I'm not going to change you. You're <laughs> going to change yourself. 
<laughs> I don't like that answer. <laughs> yeah. And it's just lovely that people have this resistance in them to loving themselves. And I say, love your resistance and then you'll move it. Wow. If you hate your resistance, it'll stay with you like an anchor. I, I, I often forget, Roger, how strong the negative emotions are in a lot of people. And, and not that I don't have the negative emotions, but I forget what it's like for some people where the way that you're saying it's almost like it sits in them like an, like an anchor, like a hook. Mm. Um, speaking to someone recently and, and I was surprised. Just the idea of making a change in their life or trying something different, it caused so much fear. And you could, you could, I could feel them almost shaking the, the, the fear of it, the anxiety. And I forgot that so many people are living with that kind of level of charged emotion, just within them all the time, always controlling their behavior, mm. um, always limiting how they are around other people and, and things like that. Mm. Um, with your work, let's let's talk about that a little bit. How do you, how, what exactly do you do to help people? And maybe we'll talk about, you know, where people can go to find out more about you as well. But what is it you actually do to help, help people? I suppose people want to know if they can trust me. Mm -hmm. Because most people who are hurt don't trust. Mm -hmm. Secondly, they want to know if you really care. Right. You can have all the right knowledge, all the right answers, but if you don't care, it's a waste. Mm -hmm. It goes past them. Yep. Thirdly, I think it's, it's the ability to listen to the inner child the crippled child sometimes yeah that's inside that comes from a father or mother or generational religions or abusive situations for is to teach them to express their feelings in a safe way instead of being sectioned and put into a mental hospital but to be safe to have those feelings but then say if you stay in those feelings you will keep on creating the same sort of relationships because yep. everything is a mirror every yep. person every relationship is a mirror of something that you need to work out within yourself and i suppose the biggest thing is to help them to forgive themselves and those people, as I said earlier, who have misunderstood them, who didn't know who they were, and gave all those negative messages or often physically abused you. Yeah. Sexually, emotionally, spiritually. Mm -hmm. So forgiveness is one of the biggest keys to empowering a person. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I love you. Thank you. A ho -o pono pono mantra. So, so I've got a question about forgiveness because it seems to me for a person to move on in life, they have to forgive. Mm -hmm. But Sometimes the things that have be, that have happened to people are so bad that you would say it was unforgivable, which is a bit of a paradox there. How does a person be at peace with the idea of forgiveness, even though they feel maybe the actions of another person were forgivable? When I teach forgiveness, I if I give you an example from my own life. Mm -hmm. My father was quite brutal. 
could never tell me he loved me. Mm -hmm. he, he was unable to express any real feeling of trustful love to me or to other people often. And one day I sat down with him when he was getting older and I just said to him one question, how dad was love expressed in your childhood? Mm -hmm. And then I kept my mouth shut. He nearly drops his cigar into his drambui in front of this log fire. Mm. And he started to cry. Wow. Because suddenly he said, well, my father was always at work. And my mother drank a bottle of sherry or wine or whatever she could every day. And she was drunk when I got home from school. I made my own. And he went on and told me his story. Wow. One of the biggest questions I say, if you really want to learn to forgive somebody who's hurt you, who is alive still, ask them. How was love expressed in your childhood, in your early years? Yeah. And listen. Mm. And when you know mm. what a person has been brought up in, it gives you an inner understanding. It doesn't necessarily mean you forgive what they did to you. You don't forgive the actions but you begin to see the person right. underneath all their barbed wire actions. And you begin to forgive the person, mm -hmm. the crippled child in them. And that's something that I'd love to see on television, is television using where somebody who's planted a bomb meets the victim of that bomb and Desmond Tutu was brilliant in developing Northern Ireland peace movement where he brought the victim and the persecutor the person who'd done something bad together yeah and they really listened to each other and the victim began to listen to the so-called terrorist mm -hmm about their childhood mm -hmm. didn't mean that it absolved what they did i'm not condoning abuse i'm not condoning what people do to each other but i'm saying just listen to what was went on in their life that made them do these things and see if there's a way of meeting yeah yeah Amazing. So, how can people get in touch with you if they want to find out more about you and, and what you're well, doing? They can email me, roger3king at gmail.com. Mm -hmm. I'm on Facebook. I, I have had to say lately, I do not want to become a slave to sure. social media. I've had to, I've got so many people who have very kindly befriended me, but I cannot deal individually with people mm -hmm. um, unless I know them. Sure, sure. Otherwise, I would n not be able to breathe. <laughs> right. And I don't want to become a slave to, to social media. Um, and that's a social dilemma in itself. <laughs> I always want to use social media for good, not for the hidden purposes, the hidden persuaders that they've become. I see. I see. Well, thank you for joining us today, Roger. I think it's been a, a little bit of a different one for the audience, and I think they'll enjoy it a lot. And uh, certainly, I definitely uh, recommend Roger if you're looking for, um, if anyone out there is looking for some 
support or guidance or whatever it is you're, you're looking for, maybe you need to speak to someone, then uh, contact Roger, roger3king at gmail.com. And um, uh, definitely someone that we recommend and trust at the UK Fruit Fest. And if the festival happens next year, hopefully it will, then we would love to have you there again. Oh, thank and you. Playing a big part of it. Mm. And, um, and yeah, so what would be your, your kind of final thoughts for people listening to this, to, to, to yourself? If you're willing to change your thoughts, change your life. Be willing. Be willing. And take a good risk. I often leave people saying, take good risks. Mm. And with that, we end another episode of the Love Fruit podcast with Roger King this time. Um, you can get in touch with Roger at roger3king at gmail.com if you're interested in finding out more about what he does. Or you, you might want to come and visit the UK Fruit Fest next year and, and, and learn more from him in person. Uh, and for more information about UK Fruit Fest, you can join our newsletter at fruitfest.co.uk. You can visit our shop as well if you want to sponsor, uh, from, help us out. We've got some t-shirts and different things that, uh, that all, all the proceeds go into keeping the festival going. So thank you very much for joining us today, Roger. Thank you all the listeners and, you, and viewers. Feel free to share, like, spread this around. Uh, share it with someone you think that this could help. So thank you very much, and we'll see you in the next episode of the Love Fruit Podcast. Okay. Bye-bye, Ronnie. Thank you.